was Mayor Durkin who and vetoed council that members bill. And so I, all, that we have hey, the longest Can I have the clerk mute everybody? Because apparently state. people can't behave. Clerk, can, can you please times, mute it? Which I'm still proud to clerk, continue to do. please mute it. Mute everybody. So, are we all going to take a breath here? Well, that's the Seattle City Council right there. A whole lot of shouting going on. And the mute button comes out there last week. Yikes. That was an argument over Councilmember Sawant's resolution to support unionization at Starbucks in Seattle. So what kind of fussing and fighting are we going to hear about this week? Well, we do have the mayor delivering a state of the city address. We'll be talking about that. We also have some changes to mask mandates coming to us at the state level, plus an eviction ban ending in Seattle. All that and so much more to discuss on Seattle News, Views and Brews, your coffee break political podcast. I'm Brian Callanan. I'm a host on Seattle Channel. The views expressed here are my own. And joining me once again from the Seattle Times, it's David Croman. David, thank you so much for being here. I, I wanted to ask, does seeing the Rams win the Super Bowl make you feel like, <laughs> way to go, NFC West division, or is it like, oh, not these punks? I, what what <laughs> on there on that one? Yeah, I, I, somebody had mentioned that the Bengals are kind of like the Mariners of the NFL. And, nice, yeah. <laughs> um, that made me that made me want to root for them. Yeah, uh, and yeah. I always like the the smaller market teams. I, you totally, know, you kind of yeah. got to root for the smaller market teams. I know. Uh, I know. And so I, it's not so much that I um, don't like LA; it's that I was, you know, sort of rooting for the rooting for, for the, the underdog. One, they but. darn near pulled that one off. That would have been interesting. Get him next time, since you will have. We'll see what happens there. All right. Uh, thank you, David, and uh, for joining me once again. And thanks to City Grind Espresso, our background noise sponsor for the audio podcast. They're on the first floor there at City Hall. Please do support them, other small businesses as well. Thanks also to our patrons, hoping to get a few more of you on board if you would. And if you pledge at the $10 level, you can hang out with me and David and clink mugs uh, virtually. David, can we do this one more time here? Clink. Yeah, it kind of works like that. Get yourself yeah. a Seattle News Views and Brews mug. It's a great thing to have. And you can do that at the $10 level. And also, our mug club members are always featured on our mug shot of the week. And this week, it's Todd, who uses his mug as a pen and pencil holder. Fair enough. That's what it looks like there, Todd. Thank you very much for sending that in. Thanks for supporting the show. And hey, patrons, send in some more mug shots, please. We would love to feature them on the program here. Also, if you would like to support the show, contact the show, well, check out Seattle News Views and Brews on Patreon. Finally, thanks to Converge Media, the video version of this podcast is on Converge Wednesday nights at 7. Let's get the party started with right here, right now. Well, David, here we are in the middle of February, and it's time for a state of the city address from our once and present mayor, Bruce Harrell. I, I know that theme, We Are One Seattle, was very big in Mayor Harrell's inaugural speech last month. He appears to be trying to hit that home again with his speech this week because he will be presenting this in the city council meeting live, not a recorded presentation, as we, as we saw a few times during the Durkin administration over the past couple of years. I just wanted to ask, what are your expectations for this speech, I guess? And also, what is our state of the city right now? What do you think Bruce Harrell is going to highlight? I think um, I, I would expect that we sort of hear a lot of what we've heard from him before, you know, talk about unity and, mm -hmm. uh, like, as you mentioned, his kind of one Seattle theme. Yeah. Um, um, you know, st state of the city addresses, you know, it, it, my experience is people kind of forget about them ah. uh, <laughs> fairly quickly, but but they are an opportunity for, you know, especially a new mayor like Bruce Harrell to kind of lay out his agenda for the first year. He might announce I don't. I don't remember any time when a mayor announced something like really, really big. But they they usually announce, you know, new investments or maybe kind of new task forces or right. You know, kind of some the, the start of something that they want to work towards that, right. that sort of thing. So I, I yeah. would expect that maybe we hear that. Okay. Um, but you know, I think I think he is probably going to talk a lot about. My, my guess is he'll talk about public safety because yeah, he has say. been talking about mm -hmm. public safety. Um, mm -hmm. He'll talk about homelessness. Uh, he'll probably talk about COVID. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know. That I, I have not seen a state of the city to date that has been I would something I would describe as earth shattering. But it does yeah. <laughs> sort of give a give an opportunity sometimes to at least, especially for a new mayor, to kind of sketch out what we might expect over the next year. 
Right. And I did want to point out there's one issue that might reveal a bit of a disconnect between the council and the mayor's office. I wanted to point this out. So Mayor Durkin, close to the end of her term, passed an executive order to hand out signing bonuses to new officers. Now, the city council took that order in, said, well, we're going to amend this. This program will end on December 31st. But Durkin told the police, keep on handing those out. She actually questioned the legality of the council's legislation here, said they needed to respond within 48 hours. A few questions about that one. But I wanted to talk about this, David. When it comes to public safety, the SPD has been hiring people in January. Publicola reporting somewhere between $180,000, $450,000 handed out in terms of bonuses. I guess I wanted to talk about what Mayor Durkin did and what the what the new administration with Mayor Harrell could do to kind of right that ship and hopefully get on a better page with the city council here. Yeah, I think that is sort of indicative of that how that relationship between Mayor Durkin and the council ended. Um, yeah. Which Roughly. is and, mm-hmm. yeah. and and we saw that a lot. You know, the council would do something and then the you know allocate money to a certain program and then the mayor would have questions about it and wouldn't right. spend that money in the way that they wanted and then vice right. versa. You know. Um, and so this just is kind of like one more one more exclamation point on uh, what had been kind of a running theme between the two of them. Yeah. Um, y- you know the the kind of forty eight hour uh, window, and but then not kind of saying coming out and saying that this was happening. It feels all you know. It's a li- it's a little um, semantic in some right. ways. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. When in, you know, but more broadly the it just kind of reflects a fundamental disconnect between the, the two of them at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's interesting that uh, the Herald administration is, you know, they've been giving interviews on this, both yeah. to the Seattle Times and uh, right. Publicola, and they have been pretty uh, upfront about the, yeah. how that, you know, they're, they're concerned yeah, showing about documents, how this was done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. And I, I say it's interesting because, you know, I, I expect fully that Mayor Harrell would support some kind of continued signing bonus yes. for mm-hmm. police officers because he, has campaigned and made explicit that he wants to grow the police force. And so, right. um, you know, I, I do think that this is probably an effort on his part to um, get off on the right foot with, yeah. with this council. Mm-hmm. They're going to have disagreements about, yeah. um, you know, for example, whether there should be signing bonuses at all, but right. um, yeah. d- does it does seem to be at least some effort to um, air those disagreements in, mm-hmm. in public and yeah. rather than kind of, um, these these sort of backdoor fights that seem right, to be happening between right, the council right. and the and, and, and we'll see what happens there because I know uh, council member Herbold at the end of last year was saying, hey, that's great. We can talk about bonuses for the SPD, but there's a lot of other frontline workers within city agencies that we might consider bonuses for too. So we'll, we'll definitely see how that one plays out. But I wanted to talk about the other big news at the state level this week, David, and that's mask mandates. Uh, this is a big one. So on the 18th, the state's mask mandate for outdoor events of 500 plus people will be lifted. I got to say, I didn't really remember that was in place, but that's what's happening on the 18th. And the governor is saying he will talk about a timeline to lift the indoor mask requirement sometime this week. So, David, I got to think the whole state is glued to the governor's office right now to try to figure out what's next on this, because we got California saying, OK, end of February, we're ending the indoor mask mandate. Oregon, end of March, we're ending it. What do you think Governor Inslee is going to say about ending the indoor mask mandate in Washington? I, I will agree with you that I think the outdoor large event mask mandate. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure ending that. Heck, yeah, yeah, means right. all that much. I mean, if you if you had seen a Seahawks game or a Mariners game or something, right? Most of the crowd kind of had their mask around their chin or whatever. At best, um, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, he said. He said last week he would likely he would likely give a date for when mm-hmm. the, the mandate will will end this week. Um, mm-hmm. You know, no, nothing in the calculation, nothing in the sort of data around cases has changed fundamentally since he said that. And uh, in fact, you know, the trend the trend of downward cases seems to be kind of continuing. And so, I would expect that he will deliver a date on when the mass mandate will end. Um, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think of what could change between now and then uh, it, right. to, yeah. to, you know, disrupt that announcement. Yeah. I guess the question is how far out he's right. he's looking. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. He didn't say he will end the mandate this week. He said he would give a date for right, when right, right. the yeah. mandate will end. Um, important. So, yeah, uh, th- th- that'll be interesting. I mean, um, you know, I think I think the I've, I've made this point before, but I think that the the area that stands to kind of be the most affected one way or the other is in my calculation, probably schools. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, because, 
you know, if you go to bars and you go to restaurants these days, kind of similar with the outdoor mask mandate, yeah. you, people wear their masks when they walk in the door, maybe yep. when they're walking to their table, but then basically you've got a whole restaurant and bar full of people eating and without drinking masks. That's right. Without masks. So mm -hmm. in, in some ways, um, but you know, schools, I do think, uh, I don't know kids myself, but my understanding yeah. is that schools, um, that, that's been kind of, that's been tough in some yeah. ways. Yeah. And let me jump in here because that has been strict. I've definitely yeah. noticed it with, with my kids for sure. But it's interesting because the superintendent of public schools, Chris Rakedahl, has inserted himself into this conversation saying, OK, you know what? We should probably let these individual districts decide what they should do with this. And I think that's very interesting because right. I, I just wonder what happens. And maybe it's going to be a deal at the state level. They're saying something, but maybe King County Public Health says, well, we need to kind of tweak this or tweak that. I'm interested to see how this is going to play out statewide, because I think there's this push potentially for some local control over this. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm also interested, um, and that's in it. That that's interesting in some ways because um, Governor Inslee, and we heard him say this again last week, has uh, sort of, at least in in I would say in the last year, has kind of tried to avoid patchwork yeah. um, responses to the to the virus across the state, to the mm -hmm. to the frustration of some in parts of the state where the virus is not as present. Certainly, um, state Republicans. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it would be interesting if um, the, the the school side of this became that kind of patchwork. I, I don't know. I'd be interested to see what schools decided to keep it and what didn't. Um, and, and, you know, we did see a little bit of a, a break. It, it appeared to be a break between uh, Chris Reichdahl and Governor Inslee last week because mm -hmm, he, mm -hmm. Chris Reichdahl had come out and it, it appeared to kind of call for a more uh, you know, expedient end to the mass mandate for schools. Yes, yeah, true. Um, Governor Inslee kind of played down that that mm -hmm. disagreement in the press conference, but um, yeah. it's there. Yeah, yeah, um, you yeah, know, but that, that that kind of gets it. It's it's an interesting thing because you know Chris Reichdahl was elected independently of of Jay Inslee, so he's right. He doesn't right. have to do exactly what Jay Inslee wants him to do. Um, right, right. But yeah, the, the the patchwork approach would, I think. Um, it would be I'd be curious to see how that plays out and how the how the teachers unions in, exactly. in each area kind of push for which kinds of protections. Right. A lot of different safety measures I know talked about here in Seattle, but I know a lot of people have been pushing for this mask mandate to end. It's difficult for kids to deal with, certainly difficult for adults, too. So we're going to keep an eye on that, folks. But I did want to talk about something up next. Seattle's eviction moratorium is ending in just a matter of weeks. We're going to talk about it coming up on Now Hear This. Well, in case you missed it, folks, a pretty big story that Mayor Harrell dropped in right during that Friday afternoon lull in the news cycle there. He's going to extend the city's eviction moratorium a seventh and final time, two more weeks, and have it end at the end of February. So what's that going to do for renters and landlords? What's the impact going to be? I spoke about this last month with Edmund Witter. He's the managing attorney of the King County Bar Association's Housing Justice Project working a lot with different renters who have these different issues with paying their rent. I asked him what would happen to renters in our area if the eviction ban was lifted in mid-February, as was the situation up until just a few days ago here. And here's what he said. I mean, unfortunately, it'll be a lot of evictions, despite the fact that we have potentially hundreds of millions of dollars to be able to prevent them. It just takes a few thousand extra people on top of the 11,000 homeless individuals we have in King County to really just have a huge, to create an even a problem that's bad, even worse. And so unfortunately, if we if that moratorium is lifted, it's just going to exacerbate our homelessness crisis here. Well, some dire predictions there from the King County Bar Association, which has been coordinating a lot of the federal funds going out to renters and landlords. David, I wanted to make sure we talked about this because Mayor Harrell is also directing the city's office of housing to distribute twenty five million dollars to renters and small landlords in addition to what King County is doing. So I just kind of want to figure out what you think is going to happen when this eviction ban lifts in Seattle. I, I wonder if the city is somehow going to be able to do a better job than the county in terms of distributing money, because that's been a big issue at the King County level here. But what do you think happens when this eviction ban gets lifted? I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to say. Um, I think, as you as you just mentioned, it really does depend on how well they can get this money out the door. Yeah. Um, that has because they're you know that. Well, it's, I mean, at least early on, there was a lot of money available. Um, yep. And the big problem was just getting, yeah, the county in particular was having a really hard time mm -hmm. getting it to people who need it. Now the county is saying that they're actually starting to run out of that money, despite yes. 
despite the need. Um, and they're asking for more. Yeah, keep going. And they're, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and so, you know, $25 million um, that could that could make a big difference. But, um, you know, I, I haven't, I, I was interested to see, you know, Mayor Harrell talking about building out a website and a mm -hmm. dashboard, you know, it, it, and that's, that's a lot to do. Yeah. Um, In the span of two weeks, you bet. Uh -huh. Right. Um, and so I guess it depends. I mean, there, there are, there are avenues the city could take um, to kind of get this money out quickly, you know, working directly with affordable housing providers mm -hmm. um, or, you know, in particular kind of, and then also working directly with like large landlords, the yeah. county had a lot more luck because you can streamline this through right. uh, larger organizations, but mm -hmm. that doesn't really help folks who maybe live in duplexes or, you know, yep. you know, fourplexes or things like that yeah. who might not, who might not be housed through an affordable housing provider, right. might not be, might not have a large corporate landlord. You know, the, mm -hmm. those are the, those are the kind of people who I would think would probably be at the most risk because yeah. their access to these funds um, is, that, you know, they, they have to take a lot more initiative to do it than Agreed. maybe if they're housed through an organization. So, yeah. I, you know, I don't, I don't know what the, the impacts will be, um, yeah. but, but it really does, I think, just come down to how quickly can they get this, this money yep. out. Yep. And this, it's interesting. You bring up that point about taking initiative because it's important to point out folks that there are other protections for renters in Seattle, even when this eviction moratorium is done at the end, well, it was the middle of 2020, the council worked on this, this bill to give tenants a defense against rent related evictions. That's specific there. If there was a problem, you know, I, I can't pay my rent because I don't have enough money because my job's been affected by the pandemic. That is a defense that actually tenants can use in, in eviction court. But it's just accessing that eviction court process, David, that I think is going to be a challenge for a lot of people. It isn't something that's that's very easy to do. I know the city's also trying to reach out, make sure there's legal representation for people involved with this. But I think we're moving into a phase now where we're really, we're really going to see that eviction court system tested here as we move forward in, in springtime. Yeah, I think I think that's right. Um, and yeah, you mentioned the kind of right to right to legal defense. Yes. Um, mm -hmm for for tenants that seattle and the state also kind of passed a version of that yeah. um and and i think you know when you talk to folks that that is uh helpful uh on the one hand um and you know even even landlord groups aren't really opposed to that because mm -hmm. um you know they for the most part kind of just want to figure out a path a plan going forward but mm -hmm. but really the problem is and, and you know edmund witter has has spoken about this before is I don't remember exactly the number, but it's it's less than half of people are actually coming forward and going through the court defense system um, you got it. and reaching yep. out to them to get right. help in eviction court. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's 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 one thing to guarantee legal counsel to people, but it the effectiveness of that is greatly diminished if people don't know about it or don't know yep. how to access it. And that seems to be the case for, for most folks facing eviction. Yeah, I, I think about programs like the city has had utility bill help in place for decades, as a matter of fact, in terms of how money is distributed to people who are in need. It's one of those programs that just doesn't get used as much as it should. A lot of people in need out there, but not as many people access the program. So I, I'm going to be very interested in this too. I think it's going to be a real test of that system. And in terms of what happens next, we have heard from a few different groups on this, including the Washington Multifamily Housing Association. They're saying, hey, when Washington statewide eviction moratorium ended in October of last year, we didn't see this massive evictions. They're trying to remain bullish on what happens here in Seattle, but we're talking about a lot of people behind on rent here, uh, thousands of people, as a matter of fact. I think that King County had some numbers just looking at this as of last month, looking at this. Uh, how many did they have? Yeah, uh, 124,000 households, more than 12% of all renters in the Seattle metro area are behind on rent and that's a big deal so we're going to track down what happens there but i wanted to move on to a transportation story mr transportation reporter if i could it's uh it's an important part of what the city council is doing this week in its transportation committee talking about the draft environmental impact statement for sound transit for its projects to expand out to ballard and west seattle and let the comments begin the public comment period just started up for this project that comment period wraps up on april 28th make sure you contact sound transit if you want to about this a lot to take in here a, a few issues david i'm expecting the council to talk about this week and i want to start with what's it going to look like for sound transit to go through the chinatown id neighborhood i know there's no preferred alternative here yet as they call it but 
we talked about this a few weeks ago. Is Sound Transit really going to consider a tunnel 190 feet below the surface, as they've talked about, to make this work? And how do they pay for it? Those are two big questions I have. Yeah, and as we talked about, this is this is kind of a tough tough thing because um, the kind of best practices these days, especially evangelized by folks in Europe is rather than doing these really deep tunnels that are expensive mm -hmm. and, and uh, have a proponent, you know, have a tendency to get delayed and things like yeah, that, right. you do, they advocate for cut and cover tunnels. So you dig mm -hmm. a big trench and then put a top over it. Um, right. The problem with that, I mean, it, as, as has been argued is that um, th that could be really disruptive to the community. And mm -hmm. um, I think especially right now and with the pandemic and public safety issues in Chinatown and international district, yeah. um, you know, some hesitancy to do anything that would be even more disruptive to Chinatown International District. And so, right. um, but then, you know, you want people to use the system. And if, right. if it takes six minutes right. to, get to go out, down in an elevator just to get to the train, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that could be, that could discourage people from using it. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a tough question. And, um, um, you know, and it's a similar one. I mean, part of this too with, um, is the expansion to West Seattle. There's yes, kind of a right. similar mm -hmm. conversation yeah. around, um, you know, how, wh what what the route to West Seattle looks like. Mm -hmm. That, though, is sort of more, um, is less a debate about kind of equity as, as yes. maybe the Chinatown International District one is, yeah. and more kind of a, um, you know, in some ways to, to boil it down in the most crass terms, like a kind of nimbyism versus urbanism argument which mm, is okay. um, a lot of folks in west seattle um don't don't really want something like an elevated train track going yes. through their mm -hmm. their neighborhood and mm -hmm. um has you know we we have heard people coming in making public comment about you know we don't want to see this this train um, yes and mm -hmm. you know maybe they maybe they have perfectly good reasons for that but it has been sort of uh cast as obstructionism by those who want a cheaper and faster right route to West Seattle, which mm -hmm. the cheaper and faster way to do that would be an elevated, an elevated track. Uh, right. there. So, right. um, you know, at, at the end of the day, just this kind of uh, gets at the difficulty of putting in uh, a large and expansive uh, transit system into a city that is already well established you know in some ways it, you, you think back to the forward thrust levy and uh the, the 1970s or, or whenever it was and uh you know how much maybe easier easier it would have been to to build this thing out before know. so many people lived here uh, before atlanta there. got our system i I, always, <laughs> right. I really love atlanta for a lot of reasons but that's not one of them yeah that's uh, <laughs> right. it, it's well it's tough and I, I think you're bringing up a really good point here david this whole idea and I live in West Seattle and I hear about this stuff all the time. Definitely a, a few pieces of equity issues in terms of, OK, how does this go through the Delridge neighborhood right. as opposed to people up on the hill uh, by the West Seattle Junction or whatever else? There's some talk about that, but I think you're getting to the root of it, which is dollars and cents. And looking at this environmental impact statement, this is the big deal. They're saying, OK, what we basically approved here is something that would cost about this much. And that would probably include these elevated tracks or whatever else. If you want to do something like subterranean tunnels or whatever else, that's great, but that's going to cost more and there will have to be some sort of third party mechanism to bring extra dollars in. And that's where I take a step back and say, huh, how are we going to do that? Is that going to be some sort of tax levied by the city of Seattle? Do you try to do that on a regional level and try to sell that? I, this is the very difficult part of it when you talk about making these things like tunnels that can be a lot more expensive. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, uh, you know, and Sound Transit has our, you know, it's the the transit taxes in the, the Sound Transit region are some of the highest in the country, specifically yep. for, for transit, might be yep. the highest in the country, actually. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and, you know, I mean, I think eventually, um, who knows the timeline on it, I think eventually mm -hmm. we would start to hear talk about a Sound Transit 4. Um, yeah, right. And mm -hmm. so the, the question is, do you kind of, you know, do you want, do they want to use their gunpowder on more funding yeah. for a for a tunnel that's part of Sound Transit Three? Um, and I don't I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be a really really interesting discussion here going forward. So anyway, folks, get in your comments to Sound Transit. April twenty eighth is the deadline. A lot more ahead on that story for sure. All right. Well, another transit story to bring your way with some trouble attached to it: a spike in the amount of reports of people smoking various drugs on Seattle Metro buses. How's that affecting riders and drivers? It's time for Transportation Talk. 
David, I noticed a story by your colleague, Mike Lindblom, recently about a spike in reports of people smoking drugs on Metro buses. So transit workers, and I'm pulling from his article here, filed 44 incident reports in 2019 about drug use, 73 the next year, and then an unprecedented 398 reports last year. That sounds serious, and it sounds like it's also really impacting drivers and riders, and I guess I would say the entire system, the transit system. Yeah, it is. And um, the, you know, the union, it's gotten to the point where the union is is making a big deal out of yes. this um, and, and raising this concern. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to say exactly what's behind it. I mean, I think, I think people could have some, some hunches. Um, mm. And then, you know, I, Mike put at the top, you know, it's hard to know exactly if this is translating directly from hard numbers or if this is increased reports. Mm. Um but, you know, at the end of the day, I think it gets at one of the kind of most intractable problems that that we're dealing with as a region right now, which is, um, you know, fentanyl is uh, mm-hmm. everywhere and it's cheap and easy to get. Um, yeah. You know, we have uh, a lot of folks who uh, are struggling with homelessness and, yeah. um, you know, buses these days, especially, mm-hmm. are one of yeah. the few places that have stayed open through this whole mm-hmm. pandemic mm-hmm. Um, while services and and places that might have otherwise kind of reached out and and made more contact with these folks yeah. um, a lot of them closed their doors and, and lost yeah. a lot of relationships and connections with people and so mm-hmm. yeah you know again it, it seems that this is kind of falls into that category of things problems that we knew were real and existed and that the the pandemic has kind of made yeah likely made kind of clearer and and brought into focus more. Yeah. And it really, I think it impacts this whole idea of people coming back to transit, being something that's inviting where people want to bring it back. And I I get it from what the union's saying here as well. But if we are going to really open these buses, have people on them, et cetera, there has to be something done here, I think is what I'm hearing from the drivers in the union. Yeah, and it, right, exactly that, that if, um, you know, because ridership is still down um, Mm -hmm. quite a bit. And yeah. so, uh, if if we want people to return to the buses, uh, how, how do we make them a place where people feel comfortable and safe yeah. Yeah. being on them? Yeah. And I think um, th- this report from Mike is both concerning for the drivers, but then also probably concerning for people sure. um, thinking about returning to using public transit regularly. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So. If if you bring the people back uh, to use transit, maybe that's going to help. I, I, I noticed Mike called it kind of a chicken and egg type of argument there, right. and I get it. I mean, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out and how Metro Transit really, or excuse me, King County Metro really tries to right itself. And I should point out that the King County Council is discussing this this week on Tuesday. Rod Dombowski calling a meeting there. Sounds like the union's going to weigh in and a few other folks. So a lot happening with this issue. And uh, thanks, David, for breaking down that piece. And thanks, Mike, for, for writing it too. Uh, but it is time to finish up the show here, David. And I've been following your tweets like I try to do religiously <laughs> every week. And I noticed that you and I... Sorry. Sh- no, no, it's good. You, it's always good <laughs> stuff, man. You and I share a terrible first world problem. How did that song end up on my Spotify playlist? Can, tell me oh, your, yeah. your tale of woe. What happened here, man? Well, I don't know. I just was, uh, I was out doing some yard work yesterday and I had been yeah. listening to Spotify. And then you know how when an album ends, Spotify kind of takes over and starts yes, playing, right. playing random stuff. And mm-hmm. Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young popped up. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, and I... I don't know. I guess I I thought that Neil Young and some of his former bandmates had mm-hmm. had pulled their music from Spotify yeah. in protest right. of Joe Rogan. Uh, turns out that there's there's some you know nuances around uh, rights to certain songs, mm-hmm. and Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young has, apparently does not fall under the category of music okay. that Neil Young has All the right. authority to actually pull from Got Spotify. It. Okay. But okay. Uh, it did it did sort of surprise me. Um, it's not you know. that you're not a fan of the music. I think I see what's going here. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm I've I don't mind Crosby Stills Nash and Young. I would not say that they are my favorite though. I like Neil easy, Young. Easy to rake to though, right? I yeah, mean, that's true. Like... I like Neil Young as a solo artist better yes. than I like them as a group. Uh All right. so I would have, you know, but it just surprised me. Yeah, no, that's just throws <laughs> time. It's like Spotify, why are you controlling my life like this, but this is a, a story for another time, probably. Thank you, David, as always, for joining me on the show here. Thanks to everybody out there listening. Thanks especially to our patrons. It's Seattle News, Views, and Brews, where you can always find out what's brewing in local politics. Subscribe on iTunes, or if you listen on Spotify, thank you, or wherever you might listen. Again, please do support our show on Patreon. Always appreciate it. 
Thanks for watching on Converge Me Too. We will see you next time. Seattle News, Views, and Brews is an independent production of Callanan Media Services. Copyright 2022.